Okay, In Love for Life, that's the name of the series, of course. We're on lesson number eight in this series, In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. The title of today's lesson is Marriage or Divorce. Marriage or Divorce. Talk about the two here, the options, if you wish. You know, some, uh, some marriages work better than others, just like some people can hit a curveball. Some people can hit a curveball. Some people can play tennis. Other people are good at math. You know, they're just naturals. And some people are just good at marriage. You know, they're like natural. It clicks. It works somehow. You, we all know people like that. We all you know, uh, know men and women where their marriage just click and aside from perhaps sickness or accidents, whatever, the relationship is smooth and it seems effortless. Year after year after year, we kind of envy their relationship. Of course, like anything else, these types of marriages exist, but you know what? They're in the minority. The majority of marriages go through various stages that are not always smooth, not always smooth sailing. So I want to talk about the stages of a marriage here. Um, these have been documented, if you wish. Um, and um, uh, the, the thing I want to say about them is that um, we're looking at a, at a big picture, okay? A big picture. There may be more stages, more detail, but these are kind of the major stages that pretty much all marriages go through. The first stage is the romantic stage. I think we're familiar with that. In this stage of the marriage or the relationship, each partner says to the other, I commit myself to you. You are exactly what I want. You are perfect. You have no faults that are a problem to me. You are ideal. And humbly, the other person answers, yes, I know. <laughs> I feel the same way about you. Now it's this romantic stage that drives us forward to be with that person all the time. It's the thing that pushes us and helps us make a, a commitment to that person. Now some people enjoy this stage of marriage so much that they go through life searching to repeat this experience or this stage over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, most movies and romance novels, whatever, are describing this stage of a marriage. And we get the impression that this stage is the only stage we should experience, that we, you know, we get married and this romantic stage will just simply go on uninterrupted. But then we get to stage number two, which is the bargaining stage. In this stage, you wake up one morning and say, man, oh man, you're sure not perfect. I'll tell you what, I'll change if you will blah, blah, blah. And the marital tug of war now begins. This is where we feel frightened or disappointed. We wonder if we've made a mistake. Oh my, if I made a mistake. We realize at this stage that marriage is give and take. So we take a deep breath and we begin to negotiate to keep the romance alive. We're doing everything to, we want to go back to that first stage. So we're going to do stuff to go back to that first stage. Now the masks begin to come off and the real person begins to emerge. Not just bad things, but things you didn't know, things you forgot to ask. Now the intensity of these feelings begins to you know, grow. Things like she'll say, well, I, I, I never realized that you, you, you didn't really like my cooking. <laughs> and he'll say, well, I, uh, it never occurred to me that you disliked my brother that much. So we have the bargaining stage. I give if you give, because if we, you know, if we're able to do that, maybe we'll, we'll go back to that romantic stage. Then comes stage number three, the coercive stage. 
if the gentle bargaining you know, in stage two, if that gentle bargaining, you know, uh, like for example, uh, you know, I don't like it when you smoke in the house. Would you smoke out in the yard if that's kind of an issue? I didn't know you smoked. <laughs> if that doesn't work, then the real hardball game begins. Now the partner says, boy, do you have faults. I'm going to change you and if I can't, then I'm going to get God to change you. And now all kinds of prayers go up to God. Please God, do something about that slob I married. Please God, do something about her. She's making me crazy. And so the coercive stage arrives when one spouse realizes that they don't have the ability to change the partner. So they go out and they enlist help, the help of others. God, mom, friends, the preacher. <laughs> we round up a posse and go to town trying to change her or trying to change him. Now I'm not talking about getting help for a real problem or a habit from professionals. You know, that's of course. I'm talking about attitudes and character habits that bug you, disappoint you, disillusion you from the romantic stage. Remember, you're gauging everything off of that romantic stage and you're thinking, well, how do we get back there? So then we get to the desperation stage. Desperation stage, boy, you are hopeless. You are a rock that I cannot lift. Even God can't change you. There's no use trying anymore. I want out. If not in reality, certainly in my head. When we get to the desperation stage, people are thinking, I give up because you cannot change. Hopefully, by this point, you will get help. And you may reach this stage. And this stage is the acceptance stage. When you're at the acceptance stage, you're saying, well, I realize that we both have faults. I'll try to accept yours if you'll be patient with mine. Accepting is realizing that the romantic stage was a stage built on less than all the information or all the accurate information about the other person. That's why it's the romantic stage. <laughs> now the interesting thing about this process is that if a couple gets to the acceptance stage, much of the romance returns to their relationship but without the idealism. Romantic realism, that's where you want to be. Not romantic idealism. Romantic idealism, you're seeing the other person as an image that you have partly created yourself about the ideal person you know, that you want that other person to be. And that's a very powerful thing. It's the thing that drives us at the beginning. <laughs> I can't stand not being with him or with her. I got to be with her 24 hours a day, you know. Why? Because, I mean, the, how, how else do you describe you know, being with perfection? And the feedback you're getting from the other person is, you're perfect too. I mean, where, where's the problem here? But where you really want to go is romantic realism. A romance that is based on what is real, not what is made up or idealized. So as couples go through the stages, these type of emotions, the question always surfaces, you know, as they go through these stages, especially the rocky ones, do I, do I stay married or do I you know, just get a divorce? Now if we think we've made a mistake, if we think the other person will never change, we begin to believe that they're impossible, then the divorce option seems like an easy and effective stage. You know, hey, just you know, cut your losses, eh, just cut the cord, you know, get rid of the guy, get, you know, dump her, you know, come on, it looks so much better. 
All my headaches are coming from her or from him. You know? So if I just snap it off, it'll all be better. I'll just take a deep breath. You know? We need to be moving on. But those people who have actually experienced divorce, talk to those people, and those people who work with people who are going through or who are on the other side of divorce, they will tell you that divorce is never an easy option for many reasons. First of all, it creates new problems. Divorce creates as many new problems and situations as it solves old ones. You've got the custody arrangement for the kids. You have hassles over money and property. The list goes on and on. Sometimes it feels like guerrilla warfare. Secondly, divorce hurts financially. You know, only movie stars get rich with divorce. The rest of us are, more, uh, are worse off financially because the same pool of money now has to support more houses, more people, and more lawyers. He's not ever going to be your lawyer that's going to say, oh, no, no, don't get a divorce. Go back to counseling. Let, really try. Uh-uh. Are you kidding me? They don't get paid if you stay together. Divorce also hurts us emotionally. I mean, divorce gets the partner out of your house, but it doesn't get them out of your life. They're there emotionally through memories and family. They're there financially. They're there socially through your friends at weddings, funerals. They bring their new partners with them into your life and sometimes you have to deal now with the new partner. Imagine having to deal with the new partner as the new partner is raising your children. And you've got to ask somebody you don't even know if you can visit your daughter. Think about that for a second. Divorce also hurts spiritually. Because divorce is a sin, it creates guilt, and guilt is a heavy burden on the soul. Unlike other sins, divorce is the type of sin that's not easily remedied, and the guilt even after the person asks God for forgiveness and receives forgiveness. You know, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. I know some people have taught that, but it's not. Divorce, like any other sin, you ask God, He forgives you, yeah. The problem is, it still hurts long afterwards. Long after you've been forgiven, it still, it still hurts. Even those who are the victims in a divorce, you know, the innocent spouse or the children, for example, even they feel guilty about the experience and, 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 and after they're unable to shake this feeling of low self-esteem and anger and sorrow and resentment, it just hangs on forever and ever and ever. In my experience, it's, it's kind of like the worst. I know people have been divorced 25 years, 30 years, you know, and they've remarried and now they have a good relationship and blah, 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 everything is great. And when you scratch the surface a little bit and you just go down, oh, they still feel the pain from that thing that happened 25, 30 years ago. And of course, divorce hurts socially. I mean, you know, the movies sometimes, they show divorce in a kind of a glamorous light. I remember there's an old movie called First Wives Club where the, you know, the women were getting even with their no-count husbands, ex-husbands, and the girls were having a good time, or divorced guys getting back into the single scene, you know, a lot of women, fun. Nowadays, they even have a thing called divorce parties. Imagine, you, know, you used to have a shower for a wedding or a wedding party or something. Now, now they're, they're divorce parties. Once your divorce decree comes through, a big party, like, come on, let's go, let's have some fun. But reality shows a much different picture. Women who are struggling alone with children to raise, with little energy to date, let alone find another mate, and immature men repeating the cycle of shallow relationships, regretting the loss of their families. That's another thing I found too. Some old boy you know, steps out on his wife, you know, messes everything up and so on and so forth. Boy, once he's gone around the divorce cycle, you know, two years, usually he's thinking, hmm, 
maybe I shouldn't have done that. Look what I threw away. Wow, I had a wife, I had children, I had a family. You know, yeah, we had problems, but my life now is not any better than it was then. I should have you know, tried harder. Well, yeah, too late now, buddy. So there's no social advantage or business advantage in divorce. Even if you did your best, people consider divorce a failure. And a lot of times the victim suffers as much or even more than the guilty guy. And as I've told you before, in any divorce, there's plenty of guilt to go around. Plenty of guilt. So I don't mean to kind of paint a picture that suggests that divorce is inevitable, only that it's an option that more people are taking advantage of these days without realizing the cost. Without realizing the cost. I mean, there are times when that is the only option, but people need to kind of think it through. Of course, the other option as one goes through the various stages of marriage is to stay married. The question that arises when one is faced with the choice, should I stay married, should I get a divorce? The question is, why? Why stay married? Because sometimes it's hard, or I don't like it, or she won't change, or I'm not happy. So here's some, re like I said, some, some things about divorce. Here's some reasons to stay married. Well, consider the other option that I've just talked about. You know, people divorce because they think that the sum total of what they will gain will be greater than what they have already. And this is not the case in most instances. People who think, I'll be happier if I get a divorce, rarely, it happens sometimes, but rarely are they happier after. All the things that I talked about happens to them. You know, in French we say, uh, ça change, le, place, uh, ça change le, le mal de place. We have an expression in the French line, ça change le mal de place, which means you change the location of the pain. <laughs> That's all you're doing, okay? You change the location of the pain. You don't eliminate it, you're just changing the location of it. Obviously, for some people, divorce has turned out perhaps to be a good thing. You know, an unfaithful or abusive mate has left. And after the pain, you're able to start over again. But divorce is not always this clean or this, this easy. A lot of times it's better to heal the pain altogether rather than you know, shifting it around. Number two, well we know as Christians, God hates divorce, Malachi chapter 2, 16. You know, sexual sin and divorce are condemned by God, Hebrews 13, 4. Those who have no faith, those who have no fear of God, no desire to please the Lord, they don't consider this idea and they'll be judged because of it and their conscience secretly suffers because of it. You know, counseling offices are full of people dealing with guilt and they don't understand why they should feel guilty. Well, innately human beings you know, have a sense of ought, what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Even if we don't believe in God, we still have that innate sense of what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And if we violate our conscience, if we violate a covenant, whatever, we feel guilty about it. For us as Christians, we, have, we come to the throne of grace and we ask God, forgive me, I blew it, I, I messed up that whole thing, please forgive me. And we know that He forgives us. But if you don't believe in God, where, where do you go for that? You don't go anywhere, you just carry it with you all the time. So Jesus condemns those who divorce in uh, an unrighteous way, Matthew 19, Mark 10. Suffice to say that God hates divorce because of the broken promises and what it causes. It causes sorrow and guilt and sadness and all those things. That's why He hates it. He hates it because it harms His children. That's why He hates it. He doesn't want us to suffer. And then, you know, why stay married? Well, the covenant. Remember the covenant that you made. Marriage is not just sex or living together or having kids. All these come and go in life. The basis of a marriage is a covenant between two people to remain husband and wife no matter what. And the covenant gives us permission to be one. 
So God's experience with Israel is the model for covenant. He made a covenant with the people of Israel for better or for worse that He would be their God and they would be His people. Now historically we saw that Israel had the both, you know, they had both good and bad times with the Lord. You know, during the reigns of David and Solomon, you know, those were the good times. And then of course Ahab and Jezebel, just one example, boy those were the bad times. But throughout these times God remained faithful because of the covenant, not because of the condition of the people. You know, he could have squished them at any time. He could have just knocked them off the face of the earth at any time, but he stayed with them because of the covenant. So when we take our wedding vows, what we are promising is to relate to each other just as God related to Israel, because we have a covenant. So the wedding vows would be more realistic you know, if we stated them in this way. I take you as my lawfully wedded spouse with the full knowledge that you are weak and sinful, as I am weak and sinful in many ways. But despite all of this, I commit myself to loving you and being faithful to only you till death do us part. Now that doesn't sound very romantic. <laughs> you know, all your relatives are there, and you, you know, the, big, the white, everything is decorated, and, Everybody's waiting to go off to the banquet and the flower girls and the, you know, the maid of honor, all that stuff is there and then you exchange vows. Well, I know that you're a weak, and <laughs> you're a weak sinner, <laughs> full of flaws. Not very flowery, is it? But true, but realistic. You're not perfect and I'm not perfect. We'll probably hurt each other before it's all over. But no matter what, I'm, I'm sticking with you. And no matter what, you're sticking with me. It's pretty much what the covenant says. So when the covenant is the basis of marriage and there are problems, the couple has a way to work these things out. They can you know, strip the relationship down to the basic covenant and rebuild and repair what needs to be fixed in that marriage. Without a covenant-based marriage, there's no reason to remain married when things go wrong. If, if you don't have a covenant, if you don't have the, the, you know, uh, the, the basis of your marriage, if it's not the covenant, why stay together? If there's no life after this life, if there's no God who will judge us, why? Why should we spend one moment being unhappy? Well, there is no reason. If there is no God, if there is no moral law, if there is no covenant, then the only thing that guides us is our own personal happiness. And if that's what guides us, just what makes me happy, well, you know, if he makes you unhappy, get rid of him. Find somebody who's going to make you happy. Because you being happy is you know, what it's all about. But we know that that's not what marriage is all about, don't we? We know that the only way to be happy in marriage is to focus our energy in making our partner happy. That's the only way that I can feel fulfilled and satisfied in my life is if I'm focused on making my wife happy, secure, meeting her needs. The exercise of doing this is what creates the joy in my life. I don't have to worry about my happiness. You know why? Because my partner's job, <laughs> you see it works the other way too, my partner's job is to work at making me happy. She's not thinking of herself because she has confidence that I will take care of her and I have confidence that she will take care of me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all relationships were like that? So I'm going to give you an exercise even if you're visiting this morning, I'll give you an exercise. I want you to go home and renew your covenant with your spouse as a way of strengthening your marriage. And if you don't remember what your covenant was or not clear, then I ask you to write up a new one. Sit down and write up a new one. I mean, you, know, you sit down and you know, play around on Facebook for an hour looking at you know, whose recipe is being cooked and who had a baby and 
whatever else is going on, who liked what show on TV. You know, if we can spend an hour doing that or watching the Olympics or whatever, surely we can sit down by ourselves quietly, take out a piece of paper or whatever, type. If I were getting married today, what, what would my vow be? What, what would I promise? You know, write it out, spit it out, put it down on a piece of paper. And if you already have one of these and you know where it is, find it, go, go, go get it, pull it out, take a look at it. Because your marriage is based on that thing there. You made a, you know, you articulated a certain promise. One of the things that I do when I, you know, when I uh, officiate at a wedding is that I give to the couple a copy of the uh, the wedding service, you know, who, who prayed or who did what. And, and if I did a, a short devotional, I give them the entire devotional typed out so they, they have that. And also their vows to each other, I get those typed and I give it to them. And I say, well, you keep that. Put that with your will, put that with your papers, put that with your passports. You know, that's an important paper. And when you're having problems, Go get that piece of paper and pull that thing out and take a look at it and ask yourself, what is it that we're not doing? How have we violated this covenant in some way? And if you don't have one of those you know, things, covenants, vows, write them down. Do it now. From here on in, what do you want your marriage to be based on? You know, somehow it might even be more effective if after so many years of marriage, you know, you, and if you can't find the original document, if you just sit down and make up a new one, you've got all that experience. What is this marriage? What do I want this relationship to be based on? And you don't need a, you don't need a, a, a minister to make vows. If that's what you want, if that's what you're sure that what you want your marriage to be based on, for you and for him, then read it to each other and pray together and say, Lord, from here on in, this is, this is what our covenant is going to be. And you'll see that it will guide you in the way you should, you should go. Marriages that are based on these types of covenants are the ones that stand the test of time. All right, so next time, there you go, write your vows. So next time uh, we meet, we're going uh, to do a, a lesson entitled Remarriage and Renewal. Remarriage and Renewal. Because I, I look around in this audience, there are a lot of people here who are into second marriages, even maybe third marriages. What about that? Does God have something to say about people who are remarried? Sure He does. Remarriage and Renewal. So we'll talk about that next time. Thank you for your attention. That's our class for this morning.